Awesome. Wonderful to have, wonderful to have you with us today. If you are a guest of ours, would you raise your, no, I'm just joking, we won't do that. Um, thank you for choosing to worship at COC today. We're grateful that you have, uh, of all the places you could choose to worship, we're, we're, we're very thankful that you came today. So thank you for being our guest. And let me, let me just do a quick plug. If, if you, if you want to know like who COC is and what we are and what we do, um, this is a great thing that's happening today called Starting Point. We would love to invite you to that. It's immediately following each service. All you do is meet Pastor Ben. Pastor Ben, you'll stand up. I, I can embarrass you. Look at him because, you know, look at this guy. Josh Groban, look alike, everything of that nature. You can meet Pastor Ben right outside on the patio by the... Um, starting point banner. We try not to confuse things around here. So uh, meet him out there. Following each service takes just a few minutes, but you just a little bit about what's going on. And also, if you are here today and you've never been baptized, just once again, a little big push. Uh, next week is baptism. We celebrate baptism. It is an incredible step of obedience uh, following Jesus Christ. And we want to encourage you to be a part of that. So if you've never been baptized before, please sign up and do that today on your communication card. So hey, listen, if you want to follow along with us today, you can can join us with our app right there, and it'll take you to the notes and everything that's going on. We're heading into the last week of our series called Daniel. I hope you've enjoyed this series. It's meant a lot to me personally in my own life, and I just want to tell you that I, I'm grateful and I'm thankful that you've allowed me to speak into you uh, a little bit over these last few weeks. Um, we are in week number five, and what we've been talking about is basically uh, the life of Daniel is a little bit different different than many, many of us sometimes think it is. It's not just this adventure story about uh, lion's dens and fiery furnaces. It literally is a blueprint or a template to living in difficult and hard times. Is there anybody in here that has ever lived or, or that you are living a life with absolutely no obstacles, hardships, troubles whatsoever in your life? Could I see your hand? I would like to write a book about you today. Um, see, there are no hands, are, are, are there? Because hardship, struggles, culture kind of moral, morally is decaying all around us. Can I get an amen? I mean, it's hard. It's hard. And I believe that's the reason that, why Daniel uh, wrote this particular book. And, and God said, we, we got to tell this story for, for future followers of Jesus to follow this path, to follow this template, because it is a great guide. So that first week, we basically told you that kind of the premise of who Daniel was was pretty simple. He, he was a guy that believed God was in control of who was in control. You know what I'm saying? And, and he continually held steadfast in believing that. And not only doing that, he not just survived in captivity and enslavement uh, to the Babylonians, which were wicked, wicked people. He learned how to thrive, and he actually became a pretty incredible influencer in a very wicked society, a godless, that's a little, little g, godless society. So it truly is remarkable. And, and basically, through that belief that Daniel had, God was preparing him for war. Does it feel like sometimes you are at war with just evil and wickedness around you? It just does. And, and, and here's what we kind of said in that particular week, which was week number two, is, listen, God will always prepare you for war before he sends you into war. And, and the reason being uh, that we need to experience certain things, and, and the truth being told is, it, God, God just knows. He knows that there is no strength without you suffering. Suffering comes with the territory of following Jesus Christ. I don't know if you know this, but, but the Bible actually says that all who live godly will suffer persecution. It will be a part of the game plan. And one of the best ways to kind of, you know, genuinely test your faith and, and affirm your faith is when your weaknesses are revealed and how you deal with that. So we really talked about the battle last, or, or the second week. And then we jumped in to the last two weeks, and we're wrapping it up today with a very simple this. This is how Daniel did it. He did it with three foundational attributes that he exemplified throughout his life. He did it through hope, he did it through humility, and he did it through what we're going to talk about today, wisdom. Hope was that just that mathematical fact that God, God, will, God will win no matter what. And you got to understand that this was not a superficial hope that Daniel had. Daniel entered into many circumstances, literally, that may have cost him his life. 
But even with that knowledge, Daniel believed, even if I die, God's still going to find a way to get the glory in this. Do you understand that kind of hope today, friends? Because that, that's what Daniel did. And, and we're like, so, so it was kind of that whole conversation of you better check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? And, and realize, I need to probably examine my hope a little bit more. And then we moved into humility, which I preached under protest last week, okay? And God and I had a conversation, and I said, I'll preach this, but I don't necessarily like this because I, I'm not the humblest of people. Ginger, don't say amen, okay? Um, Humility is a difficult attribute, but the, the, the humility thing was so, so huge because humility was basically the idea of serving people, of serving people, period. And then we kind of added on to that and we said that, that humility also means that you are serving people that don't necessarily deserve to be served in your life. And everybody said amen to that, right? And then, and then we even added on again and said, actually, biblical humility means serving even God's enemies. Amen. Right. Wow. And aren't we just doing a bang-up job on social media today, Christians? Yeah. See, see this, is, this is the problem. And, but, but Daniel exuded such a biblical, humble, respectful Spirit that he actually gained influence over time and made a dramatic impact. And, and, and one of the things that I just wanted to remind you of that we said last week, which is so true, is you guys got to always remember, if you're, if you're a follower of Jesus today, you got to remember that the focus of the New Testament is all about changing hearts. Okay? The focus of the New Testament, so when you think about our culture, the wickedness or the godlessness or, or the evil that's around us and the, how moral, moral, the full moral fabric just seems to be slipping away, or, or you're thinking about the wicked and evil people in your life, you can never forget that the focus of the New Testament is to change hearts. It's not to change culture. It's not to change governments. And it's not to change the relationships that you're in. But do you understand how that works? Because if you actually could use the power of persuasion, rather than fighting these people, you might actually be able to persuade them and accomplish what the goal of the New Testament is, which is changing hearts. And then guess what happens when that, when that takes place? Governments change. Cultures change. The relationships that you're in begin to change. So that, that's... That's what we talked about last week. So th this, this week, we want to we wanna catch up and, and talk about the last particular attribute, which is wisdom. And if you want to get caught up on any of these messages, you can always go to cocopa.com and you can watch it there and check up. Uh, if you don't mind looking at this for, you know, like 45 minutes, 30 minutes, sorry. I can, I can lie on stage about how long I preach. Is that okay? No, I can't. Okay. If you want, if you, if you've got two hours that are, that you, you want to catch up on just one of the messages, you can go there. Um, so we want to turn our attention to the last foundation of how we can become modern day Daniels and learn how to live among the lions. Hope, humility, and wisdom. So, so let's jump in. Let me start by saying this about this particular attribute, okay? One of the telling marks about immaturity and even with spiritual maturity, one, one of the telling marks that somebody is immature is because they, they, they lack perspective. They just lack perspective. Here, here's what I mean. For somebody who's immature, guess what? Waiting is not an option, right? And words like compromise, Understanding the true sense of what compromise means, not, not, not like compromise, you know, to the point of sinning, but compromise. It can often seem to be like this dirty word in vocabularies. The person that lacks perspective or is immature, here's what happens. Everything to them is either black or white. There, there just is absolutely no middle ground. And, and ultimately, the immediate consequences are really the only consequences that matter. So here's, here's the best example, ready? Take your kids, for example. Take your kids, for example. You can bargain with your kids, no matter what age, to do something extremely small 
right? Let's take example, uh, uh, cleaning their room. You, you can bargain with your kids to clean their room, and you can start the bribery, right? You, you can say, I will, I will buy you ice cream, or I will pay for your college tuition. <laughs> Just clean your room. Do you know what your kids will choose every single time? Ice cream. <laughs> every day and all day. Every day and all day they will. Why is that? Because they are at an age where they are immature. They, they lack perspective. And, and they have this inability to see like the big picture and comprehend like long range consequences about their decisions, whether they be good or bad. And, and here's what I do want to just suggest to you. If you have an adult child still living with you, if they're still choosing ice cream over college tuition, there's a big problem. There's a big problem. So you, you need to change that by just like changing the locks on your doors, okay? So <laughs> now when we switch this over to the spiritual realm, it might not be that big of a deal when a brand new believer in Jesus lacks perspective, at first it might not be. It, it literally is expected. Okay, but, but when longtime Christians, like I got saved in, in 1976. That's when I got saved. I'm way over 40 years old, spiritually speaking. Um, but when longtime Christians still lack wisdom and perspective, here's, here's what I know. Something has gone terribly wrong. When you know what truth is but don't obey truth. When someone continually, for example, if you continually uh, uh, hold and choose earthly treasures and earthly pleasures more importantly than you do what you will gain in heaven, like heavenly rewards, guess what, friends? According to Scripture, that, that's a seriously big problem. Even with something as simple, and I know you don't like me talking about generosity, but I, I love you, but I don't, I don't care. I'm going to talk about biblical generosity all the time at COC, because it is, in my opinion, one of the top three most spiritual subjects. But, but if we have a problem with that, we are lacking perspective, friends. We just simply are. And many Christians today are just stuck. They're just stuck in, in what I would call spiritual immaturity. And worse yet, getting stuck in spiritual immaturity and lacking perspective and not being obedient to what God commands us. Guys, did you know it breaks the heart of God? It is literally breaking the heart of God. So let me talk to you a little bit about the power of perspective real quick to get us going today. One of the things that kind of set Daniel apart, that, that he exemplified this great wisdom and perspective that came with it. And here's, here's how he did He never would choose the earthly security over the heavenly treasures. The earthly things just did not matter to him. And, and here's another incredible attribute. He never judged God's power and God's goodness by Babylon's temporary successes. Meaning what we talked about in week one, right? Why does God sometimes let the bad guys win? To get your attention. But do you know how many times we just falter, weep, gripe, and, co and complain about how they're winning, they're winning, this evil person's winning, and, and yet God's saying, are you kidding me? Have you even read the Bible? Do you even know what the score is going to be in the end? Trust me, you're going to be all, you're, you're going to be all right. On, and you want to be on my team in the end. But, but Daniel never did this. He never just like looked around him and said, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. He realized, it's okay. If the sky falls, I'm going home, man. I'm going home. That's what he did. And he consistently and repeatedly, this is so huge. He consistently and repeatedly responded to the sinner's that were all around him with this redemptive heart that was reflective of God. And, and, and that's a valuable, oh my gosh, that is a valuable lesson that followers of Jesus could learn a lot more about today. A lot more about. Here, here's a great analogy about the power of perspective. One of the first gifts I got graduating Bible college, I think my wife bought it for me. She bought me the Matthew Henry commentary set. It's like the beginner's commentary set of all. I still got it. 
the Matthew Henry's commentary. He's a great, insightful, very practical comment, biblical commentary. And he wrote this about perspective. He wrote this reflecting upon a night that he was robbed one night. Okay, he said this. Let me, let me be thankful first because he never has robbed me before. <laughs> Second, because although he took my purse, he did not take my life. Third, because although he took all I possessed, it wasn't much. <laughs> and fourth, listen to this. Fourth, because it was I who was robbed, not I who robbed. Amen. Wow. You want to talk about, gosh, I fail at this. Every, I go straight for the kill. If something's wrong or somebody's wrong, I, I just, I don't, I don't see the big picture sometimes. But do you realize there are multiple ways that you can see something in your life, even though it's evil? There are multiple ways. And Daniel had evil all around him, and he had this kind of perspective. He always saw this. And here's, here's where it was rooted. Ready? If you're a note taker, you want to write this down. Daniel's power of perspective, his wisdom was rooted in one thing alone, his fear of the Lord. His fear of the Lord. Daniel lived by this measure. My God is not to be messed with. And when you're messing with me and I'm being obedient, you're messing with my God. And I would rather not be in your shoes. Proverbs 1 and 7, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of knowledge. But fools... Let's all say that word together today, just so we're all on the same page. <laughs> on the count of three, fools. Ready? One, two, three. But fools. Oh, don't, why are you pointing at people? <laughs> fools despise wisdom and instruction. Guys, th this is why Daniel and his buddies always chose the path of obedience. You get that, right? Because even in these uncertain times, when it might have even cost them their lives, guess what? They feared God more, more than being thrown in a lion's den or a fiery furnace. So just think about your situation right now. And I'm not being insensitive. Because I've told you throughout this series, there's evil. I've been in ministry long enough that it's like, that there's no rating in Hollywood for that story. Think about this idea. Do you fear God more than you fear that person? More than you fear that situation? More than you fear the way our culture is quickly and rapidly going? Do you fear God more? Daniel demonstrated this in a very unique way. He, here's how he did it. He, he knew the difference between sin and the things that he may not have found personally, uh, uh, you know, uh, right, or, or, or he may have found personally offensive or distasteful. He, he knew the difference, because we got that all in our society, right? Like, th this is, you know what I'm saying, like, this just isn't right. But it's not like declared in the Bible as a sin, right? But it's like, it just, why would you do that? That just doesn't represent God well or this or that. And that's how Daniel did this. He knew the difference between sin and the things that he may have found personally distasteful. Listen, he was certain. He was certain what God wanted, what was biblical, rather than getting consumed with what he wanted, which was personal opinion. Oh, see, I'm going to lose people today. We're going to go deep into this because this is huge. To say it another way, here's what Daniel did extremely well. He picked his battles wisely. He picked his battles wisely. And a lot of Christians just don't do this today. We often confuse, listen, we often confuse what we might not like with what God actually forbids. Let me unpack that. When Nebuchadnezzar changed Daniel's name to Belteshazzar, which meant Bell's prince, which meant Satan's prince, apparently, at least according to what we read in the Bible, Daniel's account, he, it wasn't that big of a deal to Daniel. Sure, it might have bothered him, 
But he didn't go on to another couple chapters about how he thought the name Belteshazzar was completely horrible. Even though it was highly offensive in his mindset. And I believe that's because Daniel got this concept. There is no direct biblical command that he should absolutely have to be known by a God-honoring name. Now, again, because you're like, it's just a name. No, 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 this, this was a big deal, okay? In Jewish culture and heritage, a name represented your lineage, your future lineage, your future, and it represented your history. So this was a big deal. But here's what Daniel, Daniel decided, this just isn't a hill in which I think I need to die on. He was wise enough to know and differentiate what was actually worth dying for. Here's another example. How about, how about when he was forced to study astrology or the occult? And, and, and we know this from his story. He didn't refuse to study those things. And I believe it's because Daniel was wise enough to basically uh, know that this would possibly give him a platform one day and credibility uh, as he climbed the ladder of success to be in the king's service. And here's what's amazing. It actually gave him an opportunity later on, if you read the story, to introduce to the king, to the God most high. And we read some scriptures last week that both Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, the kings, they, they were like, Daniel's God is the highest God. Amen. And it's here where I just think Christians today, a lot of us, we get this wrong. Here's what I mean. Many Christians today are more encouraged to just opt out of such things because we think that taking the course means the same thing as endorsing the course. Daniel had the wisdom to understand this huge fact and truth that godless people, guess what, friends? Live godless lives. Why are you so surprised? Why are you so surprised about this? And if you read the book of Daniel today, here's what's amazing. Daniel never, ever, ever, ever forced his righteous lifestyle onto others. It's almost as if we're today so certain that God is pleased with us taking a stand. Right? Convincing ourselves that if we do so, we might just have like more of a godly influence on lost people. But in reality, what's happening with, with how we're doing this? We're actually having very little, if any, godly influence whatsoever. We're actually ostracizing people, lost people, that we have the potential impact to reach. Now, please, please don't hear what I'm saying, what I'm not saying today, okay? I, I'm not saying, Christians, that you are never to take a stand. What I'm saying is that if you choose to do so, be wise enough for for, for Pete's sake, be wise enough to take a stand on what's biblical and not just your personal opinion. And the most important thing to remember with that whole idea, right? Those people are nothing like you. Why are you pointing your finger and hating them when they don't know any better? But they're the ones that we're supposed to reach, right? So how much easier would it be for us to reach them if we weren't so con uh, consumed with pointing out to just how lost they are? Right. That, that, that really literally is how we're losing traction in our culture today. You know that, right? Yeah. We are more focused on pointing out how sinful they are as opposed to preaching to them about how much God's grace can save them from their sin. Daniel was also a man of great forbearance. He, he, put up, he put up with an astonishing amount of evil in his life. He really did it. And he was amazingly, and I'm going to use a word here, I'm going to throw it out, and you're going to be like, okay, this is an interesting word, because it does have multiple meanings today, and, and, and in the Christian world it has a negative connotation. But he was extremely tolerant 
in the biblical sense of the word. So listen, so, so if biblical tolerance, listen, actually means granting people the right, the, 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 the right to be wrong, then I, I, I'm here to say I think Christians should be the most tolerant people in the world. Right. If, if biblical tolerance means allowing somebody to be wrong, but that, that's not what tolerance means today. It doesn't. Here, here's what tolerance means today. It means nobody is wrong. Nobody is wrong. And anybody who dares to claim that some behaviors might be morally wrong, well, they're the ones, what, that are written off as intolerant bigots. And guess what happens when that's the case? They become the ones that nobody is tolerant of. This was a mistake that Daniel never, ever, ever made. He never tried to force his righteousness onto other people. He let, guess what, this is crazy. He let pagans just live like pagans. That's kind of hard, isn't it? When he chose to continually live his life in a godly manner and fashion. And when the time came, because this will happen, when the time came for him to step up and speak up, guess what happened because Daniel was a man of great forbearance and biblical tolerant. He had earned the right and credibility to speak into the situation. This is, oh, people, this is a lesson we could learn to, from today. I, it just really is. So, so in short, I mean, kind of in essence what we've been saying, Dan Daniel had just this consistent wisdom of picking his battles prudently and it just so happened that this this seemed to be one of Daniel's key successes that led to his eventual influence in Babylon and Daniel Daniel knew he knew what we need to get better at today if we ever want to have a Daniel like influence while we're living among the lions that are around us he knew that there was a big big difference between what God didn't like and what God forbade Another way of saying that is this, he continually drew his lines in the sand exactly where God drew his lines. Not where he thought the lines should be, not, not in the bargain of God, I really think that we should move the line back, you know, a couple of inches here, there. No, 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 no. He knew exactly what God meant. Now let me unpack that, because this is where we get lost a little bit today in culture and as followers of Jesus. Where are those areas that we tend to lean more on personal opinion as opposed to, to biblical command, right? Let me start by just reading this passage first, okay? John chapter 8, 44 says this, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. But let me tell you who your father is, okay? He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is, again, a liar and the father of lies. Now, obviously we know that this passage is talking about Satan. It tells us things that he's a liar, he's the father of lies, that deception is his native language. But here's what you need to know today if you're new in your faith. Even though Satan is all of those things, let's keep that up on the screen, please. Even though Satan is all of those things, you need to know this today. He cannot, if you're a follower of Jesus, he cannot touch you without God's permission. It is, it is impossible, spiritually impossible for him to touch you without God's permission. But more importantly, here's what you also need to know. He's only powerful when you choose to believe lies. He's only powerful when you choose to believe his lies. Basically what that means is the only foothold that, that Satan can gain in your life is when we sin. That's the only leverage that he has. But here's the problem today, I think with a lot of Christians, this is crazy, but we think like, like evil is, is this some sort of contagious disease. That is not what evil is, friends. Evil is not a contagious disease that if you touch, you will become contaminated. Let me tell you what evil is. Evil is sin, and sin is a choice. It is a choice. 
That is what evil is. So you don't have to ever worry about being accidentally contaminated, okay? Just to help you out a little bit. However, here's the thing. Unfortunately, when fear continues to manifest itself in your life that exists in many of us, then it's nothing more than just continually believing the lies of Satan, which what we said earlier gives, gives him more power. So when, when fear takes over our lives, here's what happens a lot of times. We can often mistake in our lives what is biblical and what is personal opinion. Very easily can this be done. And we can make this mistake. And Daniel never, ever made this mistake. And two of the ways that we often make this mistake today are this. We can add to the rules of Scripture, which that... By the way, if you read the New Testament before, go read that. Ask the, ask, you know, the Pharisees how that went. But when fear manifests ourselves in ourselves, we can either add to the rules of Scripture or we can run away from anything that we perceive to be spiritually contaminated. And Christians today are so good at this. Oh, gosh. They are so good at this. Bur bull both of these, these behaviors lead us to, be, to, to often be led in our lives by personal opinion rather than what's biblically uh, 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 mandated from Scripture. And, and here's what happens when we do this. We lose our credibility and our influence in the culture around us. We just do. So here, here's a couple examples. Ready? Here's the first one today. Legalism. Legalism is the first example of leading your life by personal opinion. Legalism is simple today. All right, it's a simple definition. It means this. It means when you add extra rules to the Bible. That's simply all it is. Now listen, I get this. It may come with good intentions from the beginning. It may come, and it may even appear to basically be promoting righteousness. But let me tell you where legalism really is rooted from. Pride. And then it also then leads to an isolated life. A reputation that when you hang around non-Christians and you're legalistic, they just think you're weird. Flat out weird. That is what it is. And in case you've never noticed this, here's what I've, I've often learned with, with, with legalism. Extra biblical and legalistic rules are often based on the Bible, but they're never found in the Bible. The Apostle Paul has some pretty harsh words about legalism. He said this, Colossians 3, uh, 2, 20 through 23. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why? Why? As though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance, they have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but, but, they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Here's the bottom line. If you know of somebody that is legalistic or you kind of lean towards legalism in your own life, I'm going to say this very clearly today. God don't need your help. <laughs> listen, listen. He got it right the first time. Okay? And I just don't think that God is up in heaven with his, you know, his clipboard saying, oh gosh, I messed up with that one. I hope Josh fixes that. <laughs> I hope he rectifies the scripture that I allowed in, you know, you know, inspired word of God. I hope he makes sure that they clearly understand that today because I don't think I was clear on that. He doesn't need you to be an editor for him. And he doesn't take too kindly when we do. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Every word of God is flawless. Flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. So do not add to his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Wow. Here's the second example of personal opinion being led. 
The fear of contamination. We kind of alluded to this. This basically means when you run from anything that is remotely connected to the enemy. Do you know the Bible actually says that we are supposed to live, uh, you know, we we're supposed to be in this world but not of this world. Which means we can't escape that fact in our life. Okay? Now this doesn't mean that we're supposed to take our enemies lightly. It doesn't mean that. We'd be a fool to take our enemies lightly, or the enemy, which is Satan. But it is to say that every time that Satan roars, that we're supposed to run away from him. Now, that's not what my Bible says. My Bible says that we are supposed to resist the devil, not run from the devil. It says that very clearly in Scripture. That, that's actually probably why Daniel didn't have any problems studying the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Why is that, Josh? Because he wasn't afraid to be in the presence of evil. Because he knew that probably was when the power of God was most perfect. And this seems to be a serious problem with a lot of Christians today. We, we just think like, you know, evil is this communicable disease. We, we fear to rub shoulders with, with outspoken non-Christians. And guys, when we do that, do you know this? We're, we're diminishing the power of the cross when we do that. We are diminishing the power of the cross. Are you, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Christians who live more by personal opinion rather than biblical truth today, in, in my estimation, they make no sense at all. No sense at all. And their actions and their words, they, they're just failing to honor God with that. They forget this powerful passage found in 1 John, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And contrary to what we think today, once again, one of those words that tolerant, compromise is not a dirty word. It can be a dirty word, but, but in the spiritual sense, it's not. Here's why. Because mercy will trump sacrifice every time. Every time mercy will trump sacrifice. But for some reason today, you know, th this compromise carries with it this negative connotation. It means like we're weak or disobedient. But in reality, it's actually what wise people do very well. It's because wise people know what battles they can win and know what battles they can fight later. I'm telling you. We don't want this to happen, do we? Because if we let in, they win. Are the Babylonians still ruling this world today? No. Did God let the Babylonians win? No. Did, did he let the Philistines win? No, 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 no. He, he, he doesn't do that. Because in the end, God wins, always. Always wins. And Daniel knew this idea so well. That sometimes he had to make some really tough calls in regards to what he should participate in or what I should avoid. And if we go back to be, you know, to be a fly on the wall back in that day, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that many of us would probably not agree with every decision that Daniel made. And some of us would often write him off and say those are inappropriate compromises that Daniel made. Do you, do you know how often this is going on in the world today where we will point to somebody? We will point to somebody and say they're a spiritual compromiser. I can't believe they're letting that happen in their church. I can't believe they're doing this or doing that. The most important thing, though, if you read the story of Dan, that you cannot deny is this fact. God apparently was okay with them. God apparently was okay with some of the decisions that Daniel had to make. Why is that, Josh? Because I believe God knew Daniel's heart. And he blessed his decisions, even though some of them might have kind of seemed sketchy at times. You see, celebrators, there, there is something that personal opinion-based or fear-based Christianity misses. If you are living your life based on, on, on your opinions, and that, that is your moral standard then all you're doing is you're seeing God this way. You're just, he's just some God up there waiting to nail you. Just waiting to get you. 
And, and it quickly dismisses the very fact that God was nailed to a cross for your benefit. Let me, let me give you some encouraging thoughts today if you're out there and you're living this fear-based relationship with God. God is not looking to punish you. He is looking for ways to bless you. And when you're out there and you're griping and you're complaining and you're moaning because you're like, I follow Jesus and nothing's going well, nothing's going well. He must be punishing me. Are you kidding me? That's your fault, not his. He wants to bless you. And if you're not getting blessings from God, guess what that means? You're not living obedient. It's that simple. When you live obediently, he blesses you because that's what God wants to do for you. Thank you. Why is that the case? Because, I've already said it, because God always values mercy over sacrifice. If you are faced with a battle of truth or grace, even though I believe the scriptures can teach us how we can balance them both, please, with somebody difficult in your life, please always err more on the side of grace than truth. Because when you do, I've said this so many times at COC, when you grace, grace, grace somebody to death, even when they don't deserve it, guess what happens? You become like Daniel, and you earn the right. You earn the right to eventually speak truth. <laughs> don't take my word for it. Hosea 6.6, 6, this is speaking, this is God. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Matthew 9.13, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Daniel modeled this so, so well, friends. Daniel never worried about doing what he didn't know. He only worried about obeying what he did know. I'm going to say that again because there's some power in those words. Daniel, Daniel never worried about what he didn't, about doing what he didn't know. When it came to that, he just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just obey. I'm going to obey. And in those situations that he obeyed, that's when God seemed to clearly show up and show off his best. And when, and when there were less clear areas, then sure, Daniel did what he thought was best. But here's what he knew. God, God didn't care what path he chose. He only cared how Daniel walked the path in those situations. And the same things Go for us today. God will always value mercy over sacrifice. Okay, let me, let me wrap up this series with focusing real quick on what God does want from you, okay? Because some of us are really confused now and we're like, what is going on? Okay, what does God want from me then, Josh, in this situation? If you haven't caught in any of, of the stuff that we've been talking about, in the midst of living among the lions that are circling man, what does God want? Make it very clear. God is far more concerned with you being faithful than he is with you being successful. Amen. See, we base a productive following uh, Christian life on if we see the successes. It's not the case. God, God, God wants you to be faithful. Hebrews 11 is one of my favorite, in my opinion, one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture. The book of Hebrews is just incredible. I alluded to this in the first week. It's kind of known as that Heroes of Faith Hall of Fame list, okay? It's what it is. And it's filled, go read it sometime, Hebrews chapter 11. It's filled with stories of just these, these faithful Christian saints. Famous guys like Noah and Abraham and Joseph and Moses, just the list goes on, men and women. But towards the end of the chapter, it kind of takes this little turn. And it turns his attention towards a few people, a few people who who were faithful followers, you know, uh, important enough to be included in the list, but it just, it didn't seem to fare too well for them. In the end, for them, Hebrews 11.35 says this, there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so they might uh, gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, chains, imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed into, they were killed by sword, they went out 
in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreat. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. Speaking of faithful followers of Jesus. Now check this out. It says, they were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what they had been promised. Not, none of them had a successful, happy ending, right? Because God's more concerned about your faith than he is about your success. All that means this, their spiritual victory did not come in this lifetime. It was found in the next. So you need to be really careful, celebrators. When you study a unique book like Daniel... Because if you start to jump to the conclusion and say, hey, listen, if I just do what Daniel did, then I'm going to get what Daniel got. See, we, we read scriptures this way a lot, don't we? Like, if I do this, then I'll get that. And we, we don't want to focus on the negative stories where, like, that's a good person, but they ended up dying in the end. I've, I said this at the beginning of the series. Dan, Daniel and his buddies are not, are not the best of examples. They are not. Okay? They're the exceptions. Not the model. Especially when you put them up to a long, long line of famous, famous Bible characters. And that's because I said in the first week what? God, God will more often choose to be with you in your trials rather than deliver you from your trials. I said that the first week. So Daniel's story just, it doesn't give us this foolproof promise that everything's going to be all right. As we live among lions, it, it just doesn't. But it does give us an amazing template of how we template of how we should respond while we're living among lions. The final outcome, though, is this: the final outcome in your wicked and evil situation. I know this is not what you're going to hear, but I'm, I'm just going to tell you, and I hope we've wrapped this up well enough for you to understand and really take this in well. But the final outcome to your evil situation or to our morally uh, degrading culture that's falling off, you know, the cliff. The final outcome is up to God. You know that, right? You know that the final outcome is up to God. You know that the final outcome is literally out of your hands. Some things you, you just can't control. And that's because our job, followers of Jesus, our job is not to win the battle. Our job is to follow God's plan for the battle. Amen. It's as simple as that. Some of you, he'll choose you to be the general and win that battle. How does he do that? I, I don't know. I don't know what he looks for, if there's a list that he looks for or not. Some of you will get to be the winner in the story. That story, this story, whatever story. Some of us won't. Some of us, we're, we're going to be on the back lines just fighting. But we're going to be following what God's plan is. E even, even when God's way seems to be leading us nowhere, guess what, friends? It, it, it's still the path to take. You know that, right? You're smarter. You're smarter than that. Even when you keep doing it over and over and you're like, I'm getting nowhere, you realize that it's still the path to take. Why is that? Because he's always right even when you think he's wrong. Maybe that's why they call him God. I love how the writer of Proverbs said it. Ready? You've heard this verse. It's one of the more like familiar verses in Scripture. But I tacked on a second part of the verse, which is often let out, because usually we just read Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. But you need to hear 7, too. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. And here's verse 7, ready? Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord... And shun evil. Why does that verse get left off? Guys, you get, don't you, that if you keep 
viewing your battles that you're battling in as a winning or losing mentality, you get that you're keeping score by the wrong scorecard. Because the right scorecard is this. Obedience. No matter what, at all costs. Because if and when you do the right thing, guess what, guys? You're being faithful. If and when you do the right thing, you're being faithful. Even if you're getting the wrong results. Take this, just one last example. Jesus, let's just use the, the dude himself. Jesus and his apostles. You know that they really did have little to no almost like cultural influence. I'm not being blasphemous here. Just let me unpack this before you write me off. They really did have little cultural influence. Sure, we read the story of Jesus, he drew large crowds, but here's what you don't often take in consideration. By the time that he ascended into heaven shortly after his miraculous resurrection, you get that his cultural following, right, had dwindled down to about 120 or so people that were hiding out in an upper room. I mean, I'm thinking of Jesus... Jesus were to really manipulate the situation, he probably wouldn't have manipulated it that way. But he gives us the choice to how we respond to things. Beautiful, beautiful gift from God. But he would have probably thought, man, I, a couple thousand might be really cool right about now. You know, we could take Rome maybe. But 120 of them scared to death. All of them, except one of his disciples, died a martyr's death. They died. They died for their faith. I think you could chalk that one up as hardly reaching and having a cultural influence. Yet, here's what we do know. You have a book in your hand, which is a collection of writings that's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword and living and breathing. And all of this was so powerful as this. They were faithful as it came. And we have it as a result of them. You know that, right? You know that from 120 scared, freaked out followers of Jesus, his, his chosen few, all dying but one, you get that because they were faithful, you and I are here today. Amen. You get that, right? Amen. That's what I know. That sometimes, sometimes the culture that we live in, sometimes the wicked and evil people around us, sometimes they respond to godly living. But sometimes they don't. They don't. It's just out of our hands. But that's where, that's where the story of Daniel shows up. And it shows us how we are to live among the lions. Even when we're, you know, we're promoted and even when we're imprisoned. Fact. You never, ever, ever can underestimate your influence in the dark world that's around you. Because here's what I know. Here's what I know. Because it does appear this way a lot of times in our, in our personal lives. As it gets darker and darker and darker. Don't underestimate, friends. Don't underestimate the power that your little light can have. Yes. Amen. Don't underestimate it. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. Hope, humility, and wisdom. That's how Daniel survived and learned how to thrive. And how you too can. So maybe what's next for you today is this. Maybe somebody here when we have this moment of responding to the Holy Spirit's lead in our life. 
maybe somebody here today needs to come forward and you just need to ask God to show you if you're fighting the right battles. I think a lot of us are just fighting the wrong battles. And you need to ask him to, to, to clarify for you, is this, is this a hill that's worth dying on or do I just need to let this one go? Because I may lose the war and win the battle and that's not worth it. Some of you need to ask God to show you where it is that you might not be obediently following him today. Where you might be more concerned about what you prefer, your personal opinion over what is actually a biblical mandate. And you need to ask God to show you the path of obedience and for you to follow it obediently and faithfully regardless. That's what somebody needs to do today. We're going to pray and I'm going to ask you to respond as God would lead in your life. But be faithful, friends. That's what you're called to do. Be faithful. Jesus, thank you for today. We love you. We praise you. We honor you for being such an amazing, gracious, and merciful God. And I just pray that somebody here today, the light went on, and they realized they're not, right, they're not walking the right path right now. And they need to increase their hope they need to work on that humility. And they need to demonstrate some wisdom. And then trust you. Trust you, God, with the results, no matter what they are. I just ask that you would encourage somebody to respond today to that in their life. We love you so much. We praise you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand and worship one last time.